Family and fellow soldiers, I'm the Professor, and this is the Moment of Truth. It's just a fact that there's four things that black folks tend not to handle very well. Religion, politics, athletics, and sports. Four subjects that black folks have a lot of trouble containing themselves on. Let us be careful as we delve into this one. Dave Chappelle has been demonized, slandered, and libeled because he said something that we all know to be true. He told some unpleasant facts about a lot of white supremacists in Hollywood and in the media that they didn't want anyone else hearing. Ever since he went on Oprah's show and revealed the dirty truth that Hollywood makes it a point to force black men to put on dresses as a form of emasculation, he's been a marked man in the media ever since. But what he said is the absolute truth. There is a tremendous amount of anti-black racism from the LGBT community. And the reason that so many of the white media have been trying to demonize him and cancel him and shame him from the public stage is precisely because they feel like he's talking about them. There's a large number of producers and executives and creatives in Hollywood who identify as LGBT and they'll be the first ones to tell you that they understand what it means to be discriminated against because of their sexual orientation. But if that's the case... Why is it that the most vile and disgusting depictions of anti-black racism have come from these same LGBT producers, executives, and creatives in Hollywood? Apparently, what they learned about discrimination was how to dish it out. For example, let's take the now-disgraced former Hollywood director Brian Singer. He directed three of the X-Men movies, and he wrote X-Men First Class. He also produced and directed X-Men Days of Future Past. Now, those last two in particular are important because those two movies are the only ones where there's a black man who's in the cast. All of those X-Men movies that they made, and they decided that they only had room for a black man in two of them, and they killed off both of those black male characters in each movie. They didn't make it past the halfway point of the film. I think they also killed Storm off, too. That's not a creative choice. It was a racial one, made by a pervert who's made it a point not to have black people in his movies. You could take a look at Brian Singer's filmography. Look at all the movies that he's made. You can count the number of black people in his movies. I'm talking about characters, not some background extra. But the people who actually have speaking parts, you can count them all on one hand and still have enough fingers left to drive. Another example is Lee Daniels. We all know Lee, he produced Monster's Ball. In that movie, Billy Bob Thornton plays a southern prison guard whose job is to execute black inmates. One of the inmates is the husband of Halle Berry's character. After Billy Bob executes the husband of Halle Berry, later on in the movie, Billy Bob winds up driving Berry home, and this is the infamous sex scene that those two had together. For the few people unfortunate enough to have watched it, it was basically a depiction of a low-educated poor black woman begging a reprobate good old boy to have sex with her after he kills her husband. This is one of America's favorite anti-black tropes. The black woman is sex-crazed Jezebel. Soon she sees a white man, she just can't wait to jump on him. Or in Barry's case, the tragic mulatto. Or both. Now, white movie executives love that. Because they understood the excruciatingly obvious subtext. White man kills a black man, then goes and has sex with a black man's woman who eagerly bends over for him. Basically, it was Ghetto Gaggers the movie. This is a depiction of racial conquest writ small. Those white supremacist movie executives who put out this garbage, they understood exactly what this was. And so did the white critics. Basically, it was Ghetto Gaggers the movie. This is the kind of racist fantasies that trash like Daniel Holt's Claw like to play out. These white supremacists in their sick minds give themselves permission to murder black men and to rape black women. This is the narrative that they have playing out in their minds. This is what the racists in Hollywood want to see. And Lee Daniels is only too happy to serve it up for them. Lee Daniels produced that garbage. That means he was the one who shopped the script for Monsters Ball around Hollywood trying to find a studio who would make it into a movie. He knew what was in it. And just to show you that that was no one-off, Lee Daniels directed Precious, a racist reeking pile of poverty porn. He didn't just produce it, he directed it too. In that movie, Monique plays the mother of a morbidly obese black girl whom Monique's character beats savagely and abuses horribly, 
And the girl's father, of course, is molesting and violating her as well. All the black people in that movie are evil and degenerate and there's something wrong with them. And about the only black person who's not so bad is Mariah Carey's character. So all the dark-skinned black folks in this movie are shown as having no redeeming qualities whatsoever. And the White Academy could not wait to heap praise and awards on Lee Daniels because this is what Hollywood wants to see. They're just looking for a black person who'll go ahead and be their crash dummy that they can hide behind. Lee Daniels is the poster child for internalized anti-black racism. This guy has a real chip on his shoulder where black people are concerned, and he has a real axe to grind with heterosexual black people. He's got a real problem with straight black people because he uses his movies as a platform to show heterosexuality is always in a deviant, degenerate, dirty light. It's always in the context of incest or rape, or it's in the context of some sort of degenerate gutter sex. That's what he does when it comes to heterosexuality. Daniels also directed a movie called The Paper Boy. In it, David Oyelowo plays a black American pretending to be British because he's trying to escape racism. But you also find out halfway through the movie that apparently old boy was given sexual favors to Matthew McConaughey's character. David Oyelowo's character spends much of the movie either being punked out by Zac Efron, of all people, or doing whatever Matthew McConaughey or the nearest white person tells him to do. But it's exactly what the white media likes to see. A depiction of a black man as basically a coward. He tries to run away from racism rather than fighting for his dignity and his right to have a piece of the world. He never stands up to white men regardless of how racist or demeaning or insulting they are to him, no matter how much disrespect they show him, though he will give sexual favors to white men. That he does eagerly. Is Lee Daniels trying to tell us something with that one, perhaps? Well, speaking of depicting black men as being servants, that of course brings us to Lee Daniels, the butler. A story about a black man who waits hand and foot on white people in the White House. That's Lee Daniels for you. He makes it a point to portray black people as either violent, sexual degenerates, or as the servants of white people, or both. And then there's Harvey Levin. That creep is the guy behind TMZ, which takes pride in basically being a daily newsletter that's defaming or otherwise putting out whatever unflattering or downright demeaning story they can about black celebrities. And that brings us to the latest Matrix movie. The Wachowskis used to be the Wachowski brothers, but Larry became Lana and Andy became Lily, and they now call themselves the Wachowski siblings. They've since given interviews saying that the Matrix should be seen as a transgender allegory. Now, this, of course, sounds somewhat like they're rewriting history. You can look at the work that the Wachowskis did before the Matrix and all the crap that they've produced since the Matrix movies, and it's pretty obvious to see these guys clearly were not the brains behind that particular operation. Maybe they were the ones responsible for the seed idea, but you can look at the quality of the Matrix compared to the rest of their filmography, and it's like night and day. Obviously, the studio had other writers, though uncredited, who had worked on the Matrix script. But hey, if they want to run around now and say that the Matrix is something that it didn't seem to be 20 years ago, regardless, that's fine. I'm not a big fan of the Matrix. I'm not a big fan of any of these sci-fi franchises. I'm not particularly wedded to any of that stuff. The reason that I'm bringing up the Matrix, though, is because we see that Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moss are back reprising their roles as Neo and Trinity. But who's not back is Lawrence Fishburne. You have the most culturally relevant sci-fi properties since Star Wars, and you leave out one of your three main characters? You're going to do this Matrix reboot or revival or whatever the world you want to call it, and you're going to leave out one of your three main characters? In the other film series where they're doing some sort of reboot or what have you, they try to get as many of the original cast members as they can. So why would you not have Lawrence Fishburne back? Well, as Lawrence himself explained, he wasn't even asked. This wasn't a matter of they came to him and he wanted too much money or he demanded changes to the script that they didn't want. They just said, we're not going to Lawrence Fishburne at all. We don't want him in the movie. But what most people don't know is that Morpheus being black was never the Wachowskis' plan to begin with. 
Their original plan was to cast Val Kilmer as Morpheus, but Val Kilmer passed on it. Russell Crowe was also offered the role of Morpheus, but he turned it down too. So understand the Wachowskis never envisioned Morpheus as being black. They went with Lawrence Fishburne because they weren't able to get the guys that they wanted. Talk about stumbling on El Dorado because they really hit the jackpot with Lawrence Fishburne. Could you truly see Val Kilmer trying to pull off the gravitas, the sheer strength of character that Lawrence Fishburne effortlessly radiates? You know, there's a reason why they don't call Val Kilmer to play the mentor roles. And as for how Russell Crowe's name came into contention, I can only think that perhaps they saw one of his movies like, say, Virtuosity or L.A. Confidential and thought, hey, he's done a couple of roles where he's decking some guys or he's doing some action scenes or shooting some guns. So, hey, maybe he'll fit in. But this movie's about to come out sooner or later. I don't know when because I don't keep up with that. But we've seen this before. When the first Iron Man movie came out, Terrence Howard was the big name on that movie. Robert Downey Jr. was just a former drug addict still drying out and no one's sure if he could keep it together and stay drug free for an entire film shoot. Terrence Howard got paid somewhere between three and a half to four and a half million dollars. Robert Downey Jr., the former drug addict, was receiving about half a million dollars. That lets you know what was going on at the time that Iron Man came out. Well, of course, we know that Iron Man became what it became. It was the foundation for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the biggest movie marketing juggernaut ever. And that being the case, when it came time for the sequel, Terrence Howard, understandably, wanted more money. That's the way that it works. When a corporate enterprise's fortunes rise, the talent expect their fortunes to rise right alongside it. He was part of the movie, after all. He put butts in seats unquestionably. But that wasn't how Ike Perlmutter felt about it. Allegedly, Ike Perlmutter was the one who made the decision that Terrence Howard needs to go and just put the old black actor in there to play the James Rhodey part. After all, no one will tell the difference, right? Yuck, yuck. I mention Ike Perlmutter because not only is he heterosexual, but he's also a big Trump supporter. Something that the Wachowski br- siblings are not. And yet you find that these two LGBT filmmakers are every bit as ready to dismiss black actors as Ike Perlmutter. And that's because the recipients of white privilege do not get what they get based on their sexual orientation. They get it based on whether or not they're classified as white. I say that because I know there's going to be a few people who are going to inevitably be screaming in the comments section, but they recast the Morpheus part. They got Yahya Abdul-Mateen II playing that role. And to say that is to miss the point. Now, I'm no Matrixologist, but I'm pretty sure that Carrie Ann Moss died in one of those movies, so you would think that if anyone's going to be recast, it would naturally be her. But instead, they made the decision, oh, no, 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 we need to get those two back. It's Lawrence Fishburne that we ain't even going to give him a call. Nothing at all. We'll bring in somebody else, just in case he might have wanted too much money or if we thought that he was going to outshine Keanu or something. We, we don't. We really don't want that. Now, before anybody asks, no, this is not me trying to tell you that going to see the next Matrix movie is a bad thing. These white supremacists, especially the ones who are LGBT, these guys were already doing this mess a long time ago. It's just a matter of that I'm highlighting some of this stuff. We already know all this. That's the point that I'm trying to get across to you. What we need is better people making the entertainment that we watch. We deserve better. And we should get better. But we have to understand that nobody's going to bring us better. We are going to have to do that for ourselves. And we should want to do that for ourselves because that way it is ours. We own it and control it top to bottom. And there won't be any bottom feeders like Lee Daniels slithering around. You want to know why it is that Dave Chappelle is not able to be canceled? It's because the men who happen to be backing him right now, as far as they're concerned, they're not going along with that. All the phony outrage and pretend indignation is not moving Netflix on that one at all. But understand that the same goes for the Wachowskis and Lee Daniels and the rest of these bigots who try to pretend as if they're marginalized. 
But these same people will try to tell you that why they can't be anti-black racist because after all, there are some people who give a tisk tisk and wag their fingers at what these guys do in the bedroom or how they identify themselves on a job application. We know better. Controlled opposition comes in many forms. And there's absolutely nothing entertaining about that. Good day and be one. I'd like to take a moment to recognize some of our contributors. Donald Smither, Federica Moore, Terrence, Jean Fleurival, Sabrina, Robert Fletcher, Richie Lazar, Nicole Chappelle, Eve, Bert, and Angel Minor. Salute to them and thank you to everyone for listening, liking, and sharing the message. Black media only exists because of you.